uh, it's been a fun conference so far. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, uh, I was worried that nobody would show up because, well, first of all, this is one of the last sessions. One of my coworkers at Media Current is also having another session about the Weather Channel. Wait, 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 don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> and not to mention that Dries is doing a Q&A right now, so I had my parents on standby just in case nobody showed up. And uh, So mom, dad, thank you, but you guys can go now. Thank you. Well, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Mario Hernandez. Thank you for making the time. I know this has been a long conference. It's tiring. I know I'm very tired. I live here in L.A., and I can't imagine uh, traveling and, and anything like that. So, But uh, I appreciate you guys showing up. I hope that uh, uh, this will show you something that you can use on your next project or your current project. And uh, this is it's more of an intro to Flexbox, and uh, so far it's something that has worked out really well for us at Media Current uh, for some of the projects that we're working on. So I hope that uh, you can see the value on this. By no means I am an expert at this, so I will definitely try to answer your questions, but if I can, I'll at least try to point in the right direction uh, and uh, figure something out. And if somebody else has the answer, I will appreciate if you can uh, jump in and help out. So advanced layouts with Flexbox. The title of the talk is a little, um, you know, misleading in a way because although you can use layout or Flexbox for layouts, uh, the way things are with browser support and, and the way things are with uh, how new this technique is with Flexbox, it is not recommended that you do a full layout with just Flexbox. You always want to be able to have a a backup plan uh, because, you know, uh, like many of, of you, like just like me, I'm st we're still learning this technique. And uh, it's a little challenging because it offers a lot. You can do a lot with it, but it does take a little while to get your, your head around it, wrap your head around it, uh, and in a minute we'll see why. So I'm Mario Hernandez. I'm the one on the right. So... Um, you can follow me at Designs Drive, always posting about you know Drupal, Design, CSS, SAS, what I ate last night. Um, so anyway, I work for Media Current. We are a Drupal-centric shop uh, based out of Atlanta, and uh, we work remote. We work on excellent, great projects, as I mentioned. And we are doing another talk right now on the, the Weather Channel, which we, we launched earlier uh, this year. We are working on our very first enterprise level Drupal 8 website, which we are hoping to launch tomorrow. So uh, that's gonna be very exciting. Uh, it's been a, quite a, some crazy couple of weeks. Uh, we do everything, as you can see, digital strategy, design, theming, development, support. So uh, check us out at mediacurrent.com. We're always looking for great talent. So if you are that person, uh, we'd love to talk to you. Do you guys hear an echo, or is it just me? Just me, right? Yeah, that's usually the case. So we, we'll talk about you know, what kind of problems are we trying to solve with Flexbox, because you know, people may say, well, what's wrong with the way we do things now? You know, uh, things are working out so great. You know, we're able to build sophisticated websites. Things are working out really nicely. So why change things? Well, there's a few things that we can improve uh, that will not only save us time, but it will also give us a little more flexibility uh, on how we do layouts currently. So we'll talk about what some of those problems are and how Flexbox fixes those problems. Uh, obviously, we'll talk about the Flexbox way, what Flexbox is, uh, how it works, how you can use it, uh, the browser support in Flexbox, uh, which is probably the one thing that will make you think twice whether you should use it or not on your project. We'll get to know Flexbox by talking about all of these properties, and I say all of these properties because there's quite a few properties that Flexbox uses, and that's kind of what makes it a little challenging to learn at first. But once you get the hang of it, uh, it, it does make sense, but there are quite a few properties. It's, Flexbox is more as a, as a module. It's a collection of properties that you will use, so it's not just one thing that you do, but it's a collection of things in order to accomplish what you need to accomplish. We'll talk about some practical uses of Flexbox, 
and uh, some fallbacks because obviously browser support is still something that you should definitely take very seriously. But we'll talk about some techniques you can use to make it work on browsers that do not support Flexbox. Um, I will provide you with a list of resources that I uh, used to put this talk together. Great resources, uh, screencast, uh, uh, literature, and everything else. So you'll, you'll be armed with a lot of information after this talk to go out there and learn it uh, a little bit more. If we do have time, we can go over some actual code examples on how you would do certain things. Uh, we'll see uh, if we do have the time for that. But I will be more interested in answering your questions if I'm able to. Uh, then actually going just through things that I thought you may need to know. So what is the problem with uh, float layouts currently? Uh, there's quite a few actually. You know, there's there's uh, difficulty with containment. Uh, when the content in your website is unknown or unpredictable, that could create problems for you if you're not well prepared, if you haven't planned ahead as far as your styles, your design, your layout. Things can fall apart uh, very easily if you're not kind of thinking ahead, uh, what, may, what are the possibilities for content on this particular website? And how can I proactively plan for those uh, unknowns that may come up in the future when you hand over this website to a client? So that's one of the issues with floats. Uh, for the most part, uh, they're source dependent. Although uh, there's techniques nowadays through SAS uh, some, with some grid systems, you can actually do some things where you can actually change things around that change the order, visually change the order of your uh, elements regardless of the markup order or the source order. So, but there's still some limitations there. Flexbox does address that really nicely. Uh, difficult to equal uh, high columns. This is something that uh, as a themer, um, you know, you, you will run into uh, when you have two columns or three columns and the content within those columns is not the same, then your columns will, are not going to end up being the equal height. If that is something you want to do, there is some hacks you can do. For example, add some sort of background image that will repeat itself from top to bottom, and that gives the illusion that is the, the columns are equally height. But with Flexbox, you know, that is something that we can definitely address very easily. There's no float center, uh, although this is not such a big deal because you can quickly center if you know the, the width of the particular element uh, or if it's just a block level element, you can uh, easily center uh, something by doing a margin auto. But this one here, there's no vertical alignment or vertical center, and this one could be a little more tricky. It is still possible to do with just plain CSS uh, through some hacks and things. Sometimes it requires for you to know the, the height of the element or the parent element that you're working with in order to be able to center something. Uh, there are some techniques out there that you can use, but it does require a little more effort, and Flexbox that makes that really easy for us, so you'll see that in a minute. So how does uh, Flexbox uh, solve these problems that we just talked about? So Flexbox uh, makes items grow to fill the available space or shrink them to avoid overflow. So that's one of the things that we'll notice that no matter what type of content you have in your regions or layout, uh, FlexUp is able to control uh, the, the, the dimensions of the containers to avoid the overflow. So this kind of addresses the problem that we were talking about earlier about the unknown content. You know, what, you don't know what's going to happen if the content all of a sudden changes to something that you would not expect. FlexPack does not allow any overflow of their shell elements. So that gives you some, uh, it, it makes it predictable on what you should expect as far as the layout of your, or your website. There's still some, obviously, some things you should consider and take under consideration uh, because there will always be some um, consequence based on the type of content that you provide on your website. But it's not something that will break your website. Your, your, your layout will continue to be the same way. It may not look 100% the way you want it, but it will not break it the way floats or uh, layouts will do it. So it gives uh, flex items uh, proportional dimensions, and this is proportional, uh, and you'll see in a minute in a demo that uh, how things are automatically adjusted based on its, its surroundings of the elements. So layouts, uh, it lays out the flex items, and, and when I say flex items, I'm talking about 
uh, items that are within a container or a flex container. We'll go into more detail about in a minute, so it'll make a little more sense once we get into the specifics of each of the properties. This is the one uh, where you can literally position your content or your items in any order you want, regardless of the source order of your markup. And this is very powerful, especially for responsive web design, where uh, for the most part, when you're laying a, uh, looking at a website on a mobile device, you want the most important information on the top. Maybe the sidebar is not as important, or the footer. So with Flexbox, you can actually tell it, you know, I want this area of the website to actually be on top instead of this other one. I don't care what the markup looks like. I want this area to be actually be on top. So that's very powerful responsive web design. Uh, again, we can still do some of that with SaaS nowadays and uh, some grid systems like the Singularity, GS, uh, but it's not as flexible. It's not as powerful as Flexbox is. So briefly, what is Flexbox? What? Um, Flexbox, uh, to me, is the, the new black. It's just pretty cool. It's very awesome. Uh, you'll see in a minute uh, when we go through a demo why uh, it's becoming one of the things that, one of the hardest things that I've seen since responsive web design. You know, for the last five years, responsive web design has been the one thing that everybody wants to do. And I think uh, Flexbox is kind of taking its place now. Uh, and if the browser support is right, then um, you, you'll see that there's a lot of things that you can do with it. Um, so. So I'm not going to repeat this. I'm just going to, I'm sure you can, you can read. It's basically kind of the same thing that we were not go, went over. The one thing is, is uh, the, what I like is that the ability to uh, not allow that overflow. That could be problematic for us if, uh, if things all of a sudden change for us, but Flexbox allows us to keep some sort of control there. So the concept of Flexbox is pretty straightforward, well, to an extent. We have a container, uh, and this container could be just about anything. It could be uh, a div, it could be an unordered list, it could be a paragraph, anything that is able to hold child elements or, or, or dependent. So in the example here, let's pretend that this is a div, and so that will be considered our flex container. Within this flex container, we have flex items. So these are the immediate descendants of this particular container. So that's important to realize because uh, Flexbox is not activated on, uh, on subsequent items within the flex items. It's only reflected on the immediate descendants of the flex uh, container. Uh, this uh, Flexbox, well, the one thing that makes it a little more challenging to uh, wrap your head around is that it's not uh, the same way you would do uh, float layouts where you do top, right, bottom, left. In Flexbus, you instead use the main access, uh, axis, uh, and you will also use the cross axis. So instead of laying out something on the left, you will say flex start. If you want to lay out something to the right, you do flex end. And for the cross axis, you do the same thing, flex start, which will be at the top and the bottom. Each of the flex items have, you can assign dimensions to them or you can actually leave them fluid. Uh, I've actually tried uh, assigning fixed dimensions to uh, flex items, and that works out really well also, because with Flexbox, you can allow things to grow or shrink based on the surroundings of this particular element. So uh, percentages still work, pixels work, and uh, uh, so it gives you a lot of flexibility, no pun intended. We have, uh, let's see here, get the, this first. So that's the cross start and cross end. And on the, on the bottom left, we have the main start. And on the bottom right, we have the main end. So those are the properties that we use. So instead of saying left, top, right, bottom, we have to learn this new way of laying out things within our containers. So that's the part that takes a little bit of getting used to because we're not used to saying place this at the start or at the end. Or you know, we say left, right, top, bottom. But uh, once you start uh, looking into it and, and, and playing with it, you, you'll get the hang of it. So, so let's take a look, uh, look at the properties that Flexbox offers. And I said there's quite a few, and a lot of them do offer the same values, but based on the direction that you're using on your elements, that could give you different results. So 
there is uh, uh, flex direction, flex wrap, flex flow, justify content, align items, align content, order, cell, uh, align cell, flex scroll, flex shrink, flex basis, flex. Now, this, uh, each of those has at least two, between two to four prop, uh, values. So you can imagine all the things that go into place to make this work. Now, this, the list itself can be overwhelming just when you look at it because you can figure out where, where, how do I use this, when do I use this, do I use this on the parent uh, container, the flex container, or do I use this on the child elements, the flex items? Uh, well, the ones on the left are for, you will use those on a flex container. The ones on the right are used on the flex items. So that's a nice way of kind of making a little more sense on this list of properties uh, so you don't get overwhelmed with uh, all of them. So I can tell you from experience that the properties that you will use the most are the ones for flex container. Uh, you, will, you will still use properties for flex items, but uh, the ones that I've seen, at least that I, the ones that I've been using the most to do the things that I want to do uh, are the ones for flex container. So the usage is pretty straightforward. You know, we have the, the display property on CSS, and if you want to, if you have a block level element, then the display property will be set to block. If you have uh, an inline level element, the display property is set to inline. You can also do inline block. You can convert an inline ele level element to a block level element by doing a display block or vice versa. Uh, but for Flexbox, the display property is set to flex. So if we have a container, and again, this container could be anything. It could be a div, it could be an unordered list, if you simply set the display property to flex, you have activated Flexbox and you're ready to start using Flexbox for, the, for this particular container and the immediate descendants of this particular container. That's all it takes, very straightforward. As far as browser support, it's actually very, very good, but our lovely um, Internet Explorer still needs some special attention. But if you're dealing with IE 10 and above, then you have a better you have a better success with this because even though IE 10 does require a vendor prefix, um, if you're using a tool like Auto Prefixer, then that will automatically generate that for you, and you don't have to worry about that. However, if you're using IE 9 or you have to support IE 9 and below, uh, you can use Flexbox. There are some polyfills out there that you can use. Uh, personally, I would not feel comfortable relying completely on Flexbox if I'm supporting IE9 or below. But there are ways in which you can still use Flexbox for the browsers that do support it and be able to come up with some fallbacks for the browsers that do not support it. And we'll go over some of those techniques in just a minute. So vendor's prefixes is one thing that you will uh, have to use. There's no other way around them. Uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, even Safari, Chrome, Firefox, they still need uh, some vendor prefixes. Uh, and I'm thinking, obviously, with time, that will get better. But for the time being, we, we have to use those vendor prefixes. This is how um, some of those properties will be declared on a flex container. Uh, and as you can see, there's tons of vendor prefixes there that you will need to add. And so this could be overwhelming just to be able to activate, justify, uh, or uh, align content center, uh, so you need some vendor prefixes. However, if you are using a tool, like I said, like auto prefixer, which I would highly recommend, you don't have to worry about yourself typing all these vendor prefixes. You can just let auto prefixer do it for you. And instead, you would type something like this. And when your SAS is compiled, then all those vendor prefixes will automatically be added for you on the CSS that is compiled. So that makes life easier. It, it makes your SAS code cleaner and you don't have to worry about remembering all those vendor prefixes. I don't know if there's anybody that can remember them anyway, but this just makes it a lot more cleaner for you to work with. So it's more manageable this way. So highly recommend, obviously, SAS and Auto Prefixer. If you have not looked at that, I would uh, highly recommend. So the fallbacks that we talked about before, um, there are several ways in which you can uh, go about this. There are some third-party tools out there. I know there's a Flexi, I believe, is a tool. There's a JavaScript library that you can use. Uh, I have not personally used that myself, but there are other techniques. One way will be, and this is all depending on your project needs, what, what it is that you're trying to do, what your environment is like. You know, there's times when we don't have access, direct access to our markup on Drupal, 
And so uh, this particular technique will not work because you will, able, you will need to be get into your markup, your HTML, the TPL, PHP file, um, in order to make this kind of change here, to be able to add a conditional comment that says, if the browser is equal to or less than IE9, I want to add a class of no flexbox. That means this browser does not support flexbox. And then I can use that as my main selector on my, on my SAS to say, if this class exists on the body of my page, then I know that flexbox is not supported, and I can then c go back to my float layout technique to be able to accomplish the layout that I want to uh, be able to create. So this is one way, and obviously, as I said before, if you don't have ac direct access to the markup, uh, this is probably not going to be the way for you to do it. Uh, there is another. Um, so here's the example of that. Uh, so we'll have a flex container, and we'd use Flexbox for that. And then for the browser that doesn't support uh, Flexbox, we just prefix our rule with no Flexbox. And then we use our display block and, you know, float left to be able to align things next to each other. This is just a quick example. Here's another technique, which will probably be the one that I would recommend. And this is, you can actually create your own build of modernizer and say, I want to be able to add to my build, my modernizer build, a specific class of Flexbox, which means that modernizer will detect whether my browser supports Flexbox or not. And if it does, it will add the Flexbox class to, my, to the body of my page. So now I know that I can count on that class on my page if the browser supports Flexbox. And so when I'm trying to create my rules, I can say, for anything that supports Flexbox, I can just prefix my rules with the class of Flexbox. And this approach to me is better because I want to leave the default for the browsers that don't support it. So I don't have to add any type of prefixes or any classes to my rules. I want to continue to use float layouts for those. But for the browsers that do support Flexbox, I want to prefix my rules with Flexbox, the class Flexbox. And at least for the moment, that's my personal preference, just because I am being very selective when I use Flexbox. As I said before, you don't want to rely completely on Flexbox for your entire layout. So I'm being very, very selective. I'm just picking areas on my page or my website where I like to use Flexbox, where I think it makes sense. If I need to center align something, if I need to flood things very quickly or, be, or have content a little more dynamic, then I can say, for my navigation, I want to use Flexbox. So for, that particular, for the rules on the navigation, I will prefix my rules with the Flexbox class and then leave the non-prefix rule for my regular layout approach. There's obviously other techniques out there, and uh, if, if you look them up, you, you find many other techniques. So it's, it's, it's a matter of what will work for you. Uh, but to me, this is something that is pretty solid, just because uh, I would expect that most people use Modernizer just because it makes your life easier to detect what the browser supports and what it doesn't. And so um, since we're already using that tool, why not just add another you know, class that we can take advantage of to, to, to deal with, with our layouts? So I'm going to do a quick demo of this uh, Flexbox property. So we'll go one by one on to how they work uh, and how you can use them. And so to make sure, because I wasn't sure how uh, reliable the Wi-Fi uh, was here, I record a screencast that we'll go through, and I'll just describe what each of those uh, things that uh, you see on the screen are doing. So let me bring up my uh, uh, screencast real quick. Uh, here. Hopefully you guys can read that. Are you guys able to read that okay, kind of? I'll, I'll be describing it, so, so you, um, the quality is not the best. Um, maybe if I don't make it full screen, that will, uh, let me see here. Let's see. No, I don't think the quality is, the screen quality is not as good. But let's, let's try to go with this. So uh, let me rewind this. So what I have here, just to give you a, a setup of what I've done here, is I've pretty much just created a, a list of divs, right? There is a, there's a parent div that you don't, you'll see it here in a minute. And then there's a whole bunch of items, that with the, uh, divs with the class item, and the parent div has the class of parent. Uh, you don't see it here, but you'll see it in a minute. Uh, and what you see at the bottom, the Y area, is just the result of what I've written up here. So let's start with, with that real quick. So um, as I said before, this, this, what you see here, this could be anything. This could be 
and an order list. If you're creating a navigation, this is perfectly fine to you know do your UL and then your list items inside that. So you have uh, a parent element on the top. And what I've done for CSS, I created some rules. But before I do that, let me show you that I'm using uh, SAS for, uh, for 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 writing my my code. And I also uh, through CodePen allows you to attach pref uh, uh, auto prefixer. Uh, for this particular example, so I don't have to type those, all those vendor prefixes that we talked about earlier. And so I'm going to close that and just go over the rules that you see on the CSS pane are very straightforward. It's just for decoration to give some uh, dimensions to my bo boxes, uh, a border, so we can see where things are and how, as we start manipulating this with the Flexbox, we can start seeing the effect of that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go to the parent container and activate Flexbox, and we do that by simply applying the, the display property of Flex, and that automatically aligns things in a horizontal way. The reason this happens is because um, by default, there are properties within Flexbox that are already taking effect, even though we have not declared them yet. They have default values that are already in effect here by simply activating Flexbox, so that's why you see all the boxes line up horizontally. And so, and in a minute, we'll go through those. One of those properties is the flex direction. The default value for that is row, and that's what you see here. So when I type row, nothing happens because that's the default value for that particular property. But I can also uh, change that row uh, display property to row reversed. And what you'll see here is that not only my elements are moved to the right, but they're also reversed in order. You see now that number five is on the left, number one is on the right. So row and row reverse is what you will use if you want to line up things horizontally, whether you want it on the left side or on the right side. Then we also have column. One of, is one of the other flex direction values, uh, as you can see. This is something that you would normally use when you're laying out a website, columns. And then if you want to do reverse, same thing. The, now the numbers have shifted from top to bottom, as you can see here now. So. Um, in the example that I hopefully I'll be able to show you if we have time, uh, f f uh, flex direction column is what allows us to lay out the columns of our website. The f uh, so let's go back to the f uh, row for our default value here. The next property that we'll talk about is the flex wrap. And this allows us to, you know, wrap elements on our page. By default, the uh, the value for flex wrap is no wrap, and that's what you see here. So when I type no wrap, nothing happens because that's the default value for that particular property. If I change uh, the no wrap to uh, wrap, right now you don't see anything because there is plenty of empty space still in my container, so there's, uh, Flexbox can't wrap those items. But if I increase the width of each of those elements, then now those uh, supersede the width of my container, and now Flexbox wraps them. And as you can imagine, with wrap, I can also do wrap reverse, and that will simply just change the order wrapping of my uh, flex items. The, the nice thing about what I talked about earlier is that even though each of the elements, uh, uh, flex items that we have there are 250 pixels, they supersede the width of my container, but they don't collapse my container. They, they instead shrink. There is a sh uh, shorthand for that combines not only flex direction but flex wrap, and that is the flex flow. So if I use flex flow and I say row and no wrap, that's combining both um, flex direction and flex wrap properties into one. So I'm going to go back to my original um, width of my elements. This one's pretty nice, and, and this one can be confusing with some of the other ones we'll talk in a little bit. Uh, justify content. The default value for this is flex start, and this one works on the main axis direction, okay? And then we have flex end, and that moves things to the right. Now, this is different than uh, row reverse, that it does move things to the right, but it doesn't change the order of the elements. You still see the same order, one through five, versus row reverse did change the order of each of the elements. Then we have sender. We have a space between, let me pause this for a minute here. And what a space between does, it allows us to first place the first item all the way to the left of our container, the last item all the way to the right, and then it evenly distributes the remaining available space 
among the remaining flex items that we have left. So as you can see, the only reason you see space on, num uh, on the left of number one and space on the left of, on the right of number five is because I originally added some padding around each of the elements. But otherwise, they will be flushed all the way to the left or to the right, and the remaining available space will be distributed evenly uh, among the remaining three items there. So that's what space between does for us. The, the other property similar to space between is space around. And this does something different than space between, although uh, it looks very similar. But what it does, it, it distributes all the available space evenly among all the elements. So you can see on the left and the right. Let me, uh, sorry about that if it went too quickly. Okay. Okay. So you can see that there's exactly the same amount of space on the left and the right of each item. And so that's the space, the space around property value there. So what I'm going to do next to show the next property, I'm going to give our container some height just because the next properties do require that uh, we have some height on our, it doesn't require height, but it will, sh it will display it better for us. This property works on the, uh, the cross axis, not the main axis. So it, cr it works from, from top to bottom. And so the first property will be align items. And we see that stretch is the default property or value for that, so you can see there. Then we have flex start. You can see how some of the, sa the same values that we are applying to the other properties we are using here, but the result that we're getting is different because now we're working on the cross axis versus the main axis. So that's something very important to keep in mind because that could be confusing. At first, that really confused me because I, I wasn't sure which one I should use. You know, they both have the same value, but what, what is it? Which one do I use? So uh, it all depends on whether you want to work with things horizontally or vertically. And then, uh, so that's the property that you use, whether it's justify content or align items. Even though they have pretty much the same uh, values, the result that you get is completely different. So that's the flex start. And as you can imagine, we have flex end. So that just moves things to the bottom. So again, we're working on the cross axis this time. We have center. And again, this is something that with float layouts, it's not easy to do, to perfectly center something. Not only just one item, but in this case, we're doing it with a collection of items, and we're perfectly centering this. Uh, very difficult to do with just plain CSS unless you go and find a technique. There's some uh, SAS mixings out there that you can use to do that, but it does require a little bit of extra effort. Here, all you have to do is set the property to center, and that does it for you. Very, very, very easy to do. This one, obviously, uh, it, it also baseline is one of the properties that first it took me a while to figure out. But uh, what it does, it finds the common baseline among all the elements and it lines things based on that particular baseline. So in the example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select item number three. I'm going to single that out and I'm going to change the font size of that particular item to something larger. And because I already have the, the align items property set to baseline, even though I'm changing the font size of that particular item, it will line all the rest of the items to, on that particular baseline. So as you can see, the bottom of number three is the same, it's lined up exactly the same as the bottom of all the rest of the numbers. Even if I increase the number to a larger font size, that baseline alignment still remains. So I'm going back to giving our flex items are dimension. And for this one, I'm going to add more content to our page just because I need more information. The next property that I'm going to talk about requires at least two, two columns, I'm sorry, two rows of elements in order to work. It won't work on just one. Uh, so as you can see, again, we have uh, items, uh, let me reverse just a tiny bit here. This here, We've uh, added a lot more information to our page, and yet our layout doesn't break. What it does instead, it shrinks our elements. And so, so that's kind of nice because you know that no matter what, your page is not going to break. It's just a matter of figuring out what do I want to do if we have a lot of content in this particular region. Yeah, my page is not going to break, but it may not look right. You know? So 
you can find ways on how to better display that content if there's way too much for you. But uh, you can rest assured that your layout, at least, is not going to break. So I've added uh, three times the number of elements, uh, shall uh, or flex items to our page. And let me see. I'm saying I wanted to put everything in a row, but, it's, but I want to wrap them. So now, once they wrap, they become the width that I actually assigned to them. And uh, yeah. if I, uh, I'm decreasing the, the height a little bit. So um, the the property that uh, we're going to be going there, because this one does require two columns of elements, I'm going to use the align content property. Now, this is different than the align items. And so that's why I'm talking about how this could be a little confusing at first because you have so many different properties that not only sound the same, but they also have the same values. So we're looking at the align content property, which only works on the cross axis and with uh, multiple columns or rows of content like we have here. So the default property for this is actually flex start. And what it does, it removes any empty space around that and it puts everything as close as it can to each other. The only reason there's space in between is because, again, I have some padding that I've added myself to the elements. I can uh, flex end and then you will just move all the content all the way to the bottom. We have the other property, which is the um, center. And again, this is extremely difficult to do, not just with a single item uh, the way we do it now, but with multiple items. So, and you can see here that it's very, very straightforward. The uh, space around is the other property we can use, which is it gives all the elements equal space on the top and the bottom. Again, we're working on the cross axis this time. And then we have the space between, which simply distributes the available space evenly in between of the elements that we have here. The, uh, and this is an example that I want to show you how you can perfectly center something horizontally and vertically. So what I'm doing here, I'm using the justify content property to, to center things horizontally. I'm getting rid of the extra content because I just want to show it with one uh, row of items. And I'm getting rid of the aligned content property because this won't, that won't work on one single co uh, row of elements. And instead, I need the uh, align uh, items property instead. And that works on a single row uh, list of elements. And so as you can see here, I'm perfectly centered something vertically and horizontally by just using two properties. Um, this obviously is, is doable the way with the currently, but it, it does take a little more effort uh, and, and, and a little more code to accomplish with our Flexbox. So all those properties that I just went through are just for the Flex container. Okay, we haven't touched any properties for the Flex items yet. And so uh, you can imagine how much is there to remember and to know just for the flex container? And now we can start with the flex items properties. So, uh, but the good news is, as I said before, the properties that you'll probably use the most are the flex container properties, the ones we just went over. Uh, the other ones are a little bit different, um, but it's quite a few as well. So I'm using item, the class item, meaning I want to include all the elements that have the class item, which is all of them. And I want to set the flex grow property. The default value for that is zero, meaning don't grow. That will be the, the default value. If I change that to one, we're saying I want all of my elements to automatically grow. So if my container grows, my elements will grow with it. And then that may be something you may want to do on some, some instances where you don't want things to remain the same size. You may want them to get wider or narrower based on the layout of your website or based on the device size that you're using. So that, that's the same thing for all the elements because I'm using the item class. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to single out one of the elements only and change things a little bit around for that particular element. So right now I'm telling all the elements that they can grow. And for the element number three, the flex item number three, I'm going to say um, that that can grow two times as big, you know, a two times ratio of the other elements. So this is, it, it take a little while to, to, to understand. So by default, all of my elements will grow, but the number third element will grow twice as big as the other ones. If I change 
the value of the, for all my elements to not grow, then the element that is set to grow will take all the available space and, and use it to grow. Regardless of whether I use the value of one, two, or three, it will simply take all the available space and use it to grow. All the other elements are not growing. They're just set to the width that I assigned to them originally. If I add one more element uh, or single out another element, flex item, that is, and I also allow it to grow, then what happens now, the two flex items that are allowed to grow distribute the available space evenly, except I'm using did I, did I move too quickly? Let me stop it. So the fourth item will be allowed to grow at double the ratio as the other item. So by default, uh, items one, two, and five are not allowed to grow. And so whatever available space is left it will be distributed between item three and four, but four is taken up more because it's allowed to go twice as the ratio as number three. So that's why it's twice as wide as number three. Let's see what we're going to do here next. <clears throat> so that's the grow property. The next one is, um, let me see if I remember. <laughs> that will be a uh, single out another uh, element again. I don't know why I keep picking number three, but um, and I'm going to use the order property. This is pretty nice. This is what we were talking about: how you can actually change the source order of your layout. Is it still going? Okay. Um, so regardless of how your markup is written, you can actually say no. I on my mobile device, I want this one piece to show up on top instead. And this is how you do it, by the order property. Uh, all of the elements by default are zero based, so their their order is set to zero. So if you use a negative value for the order property, then you're putting things to the left of anything that has no value or has a, a zero value. If you set a positive value, then you're setting things to the right of those items that are not don't have a property set yet. So you'll see for example here, item number three, I set it to negative one, and it moved number three to the left. Okay, so items two through five don't have a value, so they're on the right. If I grab item number, in this case, if I grab number two, and I give this a positive value, then it will move number two all the way to the right, because everything in between doesn't have a value just yet. So this is how you can nicely say, on your layer, you can say, I want my uh, sidebar. If your markup shows your sidebar at the top on desktop, for example, but a mobile device, you want to show it at the bottom, you can either give the main content area a negative value so it shows up on top, and your sidebar a positive value so it shows up last. Or you can do one, two. And so number one will be first, number two will be second. Um, but it's, it's very, very easy to do. We've, we've done this on this project that we we're ready to launch where uh, there were some content that we needed to rearrange on mobile device, and this is what allowed us to do that. So it's very, very nice. So here I'm going to give another uh, flex item uh, also, the order value. And this one is going to be for item number one, I'm going to give it the same value as item number two. So items can have the same value, and what will happen is they will go back and say, okay, what order is are they in the markup? So even though they have the same flex value, then it will, it will recognize that, but it then will say, okay, let me see what order they're in the markup, and then I will use that to list them. So even though they both have the value of one, obviously one comes first, two come second on the markup. So it will use that. And so now you can see that one and two are next to each other, even though they have the same value. If I give the number one, number two, then one moves to the right of, of two, because now item number one was given a higher value, order 
value uh, than one. So let's see um, what else we can do here. Again, this is just the flex item properties, uh, and uh, we can do things uh, for for uh, for the items also where we can actually. Let's see. Um, right now we're letting things grow. I'm just adjusting things right now so I can set uh, for the next property that we'll be using. I'm going to remove a couple of properties that I don't need because that will give me some mixed results on things that I, I don't want to do. So I'm getting rid of a couple of properties from the container, from the flex uh, container. I'm setting things back to the kind of their original setting, uh, changing the width of each of the items. And as you can see, there is no uh, collapsing of anything. I'm going to use the uh, flex shrink property, which, uh, as you can obviously imagine, this will do the opposite of allowing them to grow. It will allow them to shrink. The, the default value for the uh, flex shrink property is one. It's the, the way I understand the f uh, flex shrink property is kind of like yes and no. Um, that's the, at least for me, that's the way that it makes the most sense is to think about kind of like a, you know, a Boolean value. Is a, uh, am I allowed to shrink, yes or no? And so one, to me, represents yes. And zero represents no. Um, but uh, let's take a look a little in more detail here. So we have all the items saying, uh, yes, I want to shrink. But for item number three, I keep picking on number three, um, I'm going to set the flex shrink value, uh, I believe, is zero. And let's see. Yes, sir. Yes. So, so as you can see, because all of our items except number three is allowed to shrink, they all they're small now except number three because I'm saying number three is not allowed to shrink. So that will take all available space and grow instead, whereas the other items will will shrink. Now, um, let's see what, uh, I'm picking again uh, another item. There we go, number three. Um, <laughs> and we're going to uh, do the align self property. This is pretty neat because you can individually, even though we have a collection of items, and this, again, it could be an order list that you have for a navigation. A good example will be, let's pretend that each of those boxes is part of our main navigation on our website. But the one uh, all the way to the right, number five, let's say that is our logout link or our login link. So I want my navigation to be on the left of my page, but I want the logout link or login link to be all the way to the right of the page. So I can actually single out a particular item on my list and say move all this one, just this one, all the way to, to the end and leave everything else all the way to the left. And so that gives you a lot of control because it's very difficult to do that uh, the way we traditionally do this. But this one allows us to individually pick uh, an item and, and move it around any way in any direction we want. So in the example here, I'm getting rid of the height because the default property for the align self is stretch. So automatic, uh, these uh, items automatically stretch. This is great because this solves the problem that we were talking about equal columns height. So regardless of how much content is on each of these boxes or flex items, they will always be the same height versus the traditional float layout way. Each item will be as high as the content inside them. So this one solves that problem here. But now I'm picking on number three again, and I'm saying just this particular item, I want to align it flex start or flex end, and I can move it around. I can center it, and the other ones remain intact. So uh, you may not always see the value or, or maybe the use case for a particular thing, but there's times when you have to do some weird things with your layout or your designs where you, this may become handy uh, with very little effort. So now I'm grabbing number four, and I'm saying I want to flex start. So uh, this is very difficult to do if, uh, if, if you're working with a list of items. Uh, very difficult to be able to change things around without altering everything else. And as you can see, this allows us to do just that. So 
So um, very, very um, powerful, some of the things you can do. I believe, let me see, ah, that's the end of that particular demo. So uh, what time do we have? What time is this supposed to be over again? In 10 minutes? Okay. I could show you real quick a, a kind of practical example of uh, how you can use this uh, on a website. And, um, and then I can maybe answer any questions uh, if, if, if there are any questions. So let me just quickly show you what we have here. Um, so we have a typical layout here, right? We have a header, a navigation, a main content area, sidebar, and our footer. Nothing special. Um, the only thing that I've done is that I'm using Flexbox, but only for the main content and the sidebar areas. And this is what I was talking about, being selective where you use it, because you don't want to use it all over the place. So let me jump to the code to show you. There's a lot there, but I want to focus on just this particular area. Uh, let me first show you the markup for, for that particular layout that you saw. Nothing special. We have a container. And don't, don't confuse this with the Flex container. This is just a website container. We have our header, our navigation, and then I wrapped the main content area and the sidebar into this, in this container here, the content. And then you see our main content area and our sidebar. Okay, and then we have our footer. That's it. Our styles, in addition to what, you know, dimensions and colors, uh, which doesn't matter at this point, um, for our content, which is the wrapper of the main content and the sidebar, I'm turning that into a flex Flexbox element or flex, flex container. And by simply doing that, because the default value uh, when you uh, turn a parent container into a, a flex uh, element, the default value is to line things up on a row, right, and to not wrap them. But that wouldn't work for us because if I change, uh, where did it go? Here, if I, so this is the uh, container. change this to row. This will be the default value for, for that particular property there. If I change that, then that's what happens. Um, right. So um, if I change the layout to column, now we're laying out things next to each other. And what you see here, this is the main content area. Actually, this value here that you see here, this should, should, should be down here. But because I'm centering everything, as you can see here, um, because I'm sending everything, it perfectly centering the, the labels that you see here. That's why you see it up there. Uh, I'm not going to show that, but this value can actually, I can move this down to this area here, which is where it's supposed to be, down there. Uh, if I just want to affect that particular area, the main content and the sidebar. And then I'm using, on the main content area, I'm saying I want to use the flex grow property and allow this area to grow three times the size of the sidebar. And then I go to the sidebar and say, yes, I want to allow you to grow, but only one time the side of the other, of the, the whole width, right? So three times. So when you look at this, the main content area is three times the width of the sidebar, and that's how that can be accomplished. Then what you can do if you're dealing with responsive web design, then you can start changing things around. When we get to, let's say, uh, a mobile device, we can change the value of this from column to row, again, I remind you that this should be down here. I just don't want to uneven the other things. Um, so when we change that to the value of row, then things will stack. Instead of being next to each other, they'll stack, and that will be better for displaying the content on our mobile device. At that point, I can even change the order. I can say, no, you know, maybe I want the sidebar on top. So I can give the sidebar an order of minus one, and that will put the sidebar at the top of my mobile devices. And then through a media query, I can change that to its default value, and it'll show up on the right side of the page on a, a large device. So I know there's a lot to remember, a lot to, to, to learn about Flexbox, but I can tell you that it's, it's very promising. Um, and uh, we've used it on actual projects, Drupal projects, uh, Drupal 8 projects. Uh, I've used it on uh, some personal projects. And as long as you're careful and you kind of know exactly what you're expecting to get out of it, uh, you can really take advantage of it. So. Um, with that, I'd like to end and uh, answer any questions that you may have, if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you do have questions, uh, if you could please uh, use the microphone. 
you had a question. Um, do you know how a screen reader would interpret um, a flex box that's been reordered? Uh, so in, in the case of, uh, let's say I'm, I have my phone and I have uh, the screen, re uh, the uh, voiceover turned on, um, how, you know, how, how, how it works for accessibility? Very good question. Accessibility is something that we really try to make a, a huge effort to, to, to make sure that we address on, on all of our projects. My guess, and, and, and just because I'm not an expert in accessibility, is that access, uh, a, a screen reader will f use the markup order in order to read the content of your website. So that shouldn't change with Flexbox, even though we are visually displaying it in a different order. The markup remains the same, and so that's what the screen reader will use. That would be my estimate. Thank you for the question. Uh, so my question is if uh, there's a way to affect a sub-item of the item. So the, the specific use case is that I've, I've got some testimonials, mm -hmm. and then there's a quote, and every testimonial has a quote, the person's name, title, whatever, but only the quote ha has a background. And, th and that's obviously going to be different size. Is, is there a way to just affect a sub-item to grow or shrink? Or? Well, yes. What you would need to do is whatever is holding the sub-item is why you need to first uh, do the display flex property on, and then the sub item will automatically become a flex item. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thanks everybody. I hope that you enjoy the conference and enjoy uh, the rest of the day tomorrow. Thank you so much. I do is I need to polish it up a little.